Well, thank you, Saurabh. If uh, public intellectual life were like meteorology, uh, wherever Saurabh is, tends to be the eye of the storm. Uh, and it is, it is now migrated to Steubenville with, with the uh, assistance of, of Veritas and, and the uh, university. So it's a great honor to be here. It's, a, it's sort of a puzzlement. I began my career in politics and, and uh, public commentary as what was then known as a neoconservative. It had a different meaning in those days. I find myself uh, at this stage in life uh, associating with post-liberals, uh, so uh, having gone from neo to post, uh, I, I guess I should be grateful uh, that I'm not a semi, <laughs> as in the semi-fascist ultra-mega uh, types that uh, uh, President Biden has talked about. <clears throat> so I raised the prefix issue because my, my talk uh, has a prefix, and the, the prefix is meta. I'm going to talk about a meta-narrative a uh, very pretentious academic term uh, for a simple idea. It's just the conventional wisdom about uh, markets and the state and the nonprofit sector uh, that we all have in the back of our minds. And I was raised this way, and, and many of you, you know, th this is just the received wisdom. It's accepted by left, right, and center uh, that in the United States, uh, there was this era in the 19th century, late 18th century, uh, in which Basically, the government played very little role. Uh, there was uh, the private sector uh, and free enterprise, and then there was this flourishing uh, nonprofit sector, charitable sector. Often people raise Alexis de Tocqueville, talking about you know, civil society, all of these flourishing associations. Uh, and then along came uh, big government with the uh, election of uh, Franklin Roosevelt in 1932 and his inauguration in 1933. And the interesting thing about this meta-narrative is that both the left and the right accept it. So for example, uh, defenders of uh, uh, the New Deal, like the late Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr., uh, played up how wild, what, a, what sort of wild west the, the uh, economy was before the New Deal. Uh, and so for the left, this is a good thing. Right, big government, you know, sort of coming out of nowhere in 1932, and then, uh, so the, the, and then in the last half century or, or longer, 70, 80 years, the division between the right and the left has been, you know, do we want to shrink this post-1932 government? Do we want to expand it? Uh, so, so I want to completely scramble these categories, and and uh, uh, hopefully through some confusion, will will lead to a new meta narrative, uh, and. Uh, uh, what I want to suggest is that today when we think about the public good, uh, the assumption is that there are three realms, three sectors. There's the government, there's the private sector, uh, and there's the uh, nonprofit sector. And, you know, if you're a mainstream person, you're not a radical libertarian or a state socialist, that all, then you think all of these three sectors promote the public good in different ways. Right? So, you know, this is a government, even if you're a, a, a small government conservative, there's certain things, you know, defense and, and policing that it does well. And then you have the market economy, the, which dominates the production of goods and services. Uh, and then you have various uh, things, hospitals, universities, uh, charities, orphanages that are provided by the nonprofit sector. Uh, so we, we assume it's always been this way these three realms, but this actually only goes back uh, in its modern form uh, about a century, maybe a, a century and a half. Uh, so just to give you 6,000 years of history in, in a couple of sentences, uh, basically during the, the pre-industrial era, uh, the, there was no hard and fast distinction between the public sector, the private sector, and the, the nonprofit sector. The big distinction was between the government, which largely meant the rulers, literally a, a ruler and his family and retainers, uh, and this peasantry underneath with a very small stratum of independent uh, crafts uh, people, of <coughs> artisans and mechanics and smiths. Uh, most of the things that are now undertaken by these three sectors in a modern liberal society, the government, the, the public, private sector, and the nonprofit sector, the government just did them. Uh, it often did them 
through private actors. So you had tax farmers, you may recall from the Bible, right? Uh, you had mercenaries, you hired generals and they hired armies. Uh, so so you, you, this public-private distinction in, in the familiar sense it didn't really exist. Uh, a lot of the activities that are undertaken by the nonprofit sector in the 18th and 19th, 20th uh, centuries in the US and Europe were undertaken by the church, the Catholic church, and later by Protestant churches in Protestant countries. Well, the church was a state entity. I mean, it was, it was not a separate, you know, grounds up grassroots voluntary organization. So, so the first provocation I want to uh, uh, commit is the idea that instead of having this history of the private sector and then suddenly government appears in the 20th century, uh, the pri what we think of as the market and the nonprofit sector are actually spin-offs of pre-modern government, particularly if you're talking about the, the countries of Europe, Western Christendom, and, and their offshoots in, in the Americas. Uh, and so the second provocation uh, I want to commit is that business is older than the market. Uh, so what do I mean by this? What, what I mean is that uh, there have always been large scale enterprises. Uh, and we'll just talk now about Western Europe and, and uh, the Americas, uh, which uh, could not, they required raising significant amounts of capital and, and uh, uh, and that usually required royal assent uh, so that the monarch would uh, grant a charter to uh, an individual to have a toll bridge or a toll canal uh, and then would get the rights to the proceeds in return for building it. Uh, so businesses like this, the prehistory of capitalism consists essentially of what nowadays we would call government contractors and public utilities. Uh, and this was true until fairly late in the day. Uh, you know, we, we have this, another false image in this kind of dubious history we've inherited is, and, and this comes from the Marxists who claimed that the Civil War was a, a industrial capitalist revolution against the American South. They get their timing off by about 30 or 40 years. Uh, you really didn't get large scale businesses other than railroads in the United States until the great merger waves of the 1880s and the 1890s. That's when you get General Mills and you get US Steel and, and General Electric and these giant uh, factory corporations. Before then, from the 1830s all the way up until the 1870s and 80s, uh, the railroads were really about the only big business uh, in an agrarian country in which most uh, business enterprise, private business, it was still fairly small scale as owner operators and shops. Uh, uh, so, so the corporation, paradoxically, in American history, the, the corporate form is only used by commercial businesses fairly late in the history of Anglo-American uh, law in, in uh, uh, North America. Uh, in the early centuries of the, the British colonies and then the early American Republic, the corporate form was mainly used as it had been used in, in Renaissance and medieval Britain uh, for ecclesiastical institutions, for colleges, for, for orphanages, uh, and sometimes for these uh, public utility type things, which were mostly infrastructure. You know, it was mills, it was uh, uh, toll roads, uh, it was uh, you know, like water systems. Uh, which could be either municipal or private, but they were incorporated. And uh, cities were corporations of state governments uh, up until the early 20th century when there was a move towards home rule statute. I don't want to get into that too much, but, but the point is, uh, at, in the early republic, most businesses were partnerships or sole proprietorships, uh, not corporations. So, well, why did you have a move towards the corporate form? Well, uh, the essence of the modern corporation is limited liability, which began as a, a, an aspect of the sovereign. Uh, that is, you could not sue the king uh, if, if something went wrong. Uh, uh, so so to the, the grant of a charter that grants limited liability to a private enterprise was very important to the development of industrial capitalism because under the old partnership or sole proprietorship form, if I raise money from you uh, to build a, a uh, you know, steel mill, 
uh, and then it goes bankrupt, then you could sue me for all of my net worth. Well, you're not going to find many capitalists investing in enterprise. You can sue the shareholders, owners of the corporation. Uh, so in order to have shareholders willing to put money into really enormous pools of capital to, to invest in large-scale factories, uh, apart from these, these sort of infrastructure utilities, uh, limited liability is just, maybe there are other ways you could do it, but this is the way that we've done it in, in the uh, Anglo-American world. Uh, and it was a great success. I, I think, you know, this is industrial capitalism, uh, properly regulated and, and balanced is, is one of the great inventions of, America, of, of world civilization. It, it's, it's created enormous wealth and will continue to do so within limits. But that's, that's the point of my, my talk today. Uh, so initially, uh, business corporations seeking the corporate form had to get special charters from the legislature. Uh, and these generally limited the purpose of the business. So uh, the, you know, the archetypical thing was like a toll, toll bridge, right? I want to get a bridge you know, across the river in Steubenville, so I get the Ohio legislature uh, to do it. Over time, and, and I won't go into details here, uh, there's a shift from special incorporation to uh, general incorporation. It begins in Britain, comes to the United States. By the late 19th century, most of the states have revised their laws to a general incorporation. Uh, and they become more and more liberal as a result of a race to the bottom, which is eventually won in the late 19th century by New Jersey and by Delaware, uh, because they have the fewest restrictions on what you can do. So, so, you know, this is my next provocation, which is how weird our present corporate charter system is. It's really weird from a historical perspective because uh, uh, Johnny, Burke, and I can uh, go to the, we can probably go online, right? And it's the Ohio Secretary of State or whatever and, and create the Acme Corporation. And the purpose of the Acme Corporation is to make money, right? Not to make anything in particular, it's just to make money. And this would obstruct someone in the Ohio legislature in 1822. It's very, very strange. Like, well, are you going to have a bridge? Or are you going to, like, have a blacksmith shop? Or We don't know. We're just going to make money. We'll try one thing. You know, we'll try, uh, uh, you know, dog racing. And if that doesn't work out, then we'll try dry cleaning. And, but we're just going to make money. So, so... The Ohio legislature in 1822 was like, get out of here, right? In uh, 2022, they'd say, okay, it's like just it's like an automatic process, right? So we've now created this perpetual, you know, potentially immortal corporation, the Acme Corporation, and we have limited liability, and we can do whatever we want. And we don't have to do it in the United States. We don't have to do it in Ohio or America. Like, we can do it in the Philippines, you know, whatever. Uh, and we have limited liability. This is like great you know, a uh, sovereign gift. And we've done it by filling out a form, you know, on, on the uh, Secretary of State's website. Uh, so, so that's where you get the modern corporation, which uh, the purpose, the corporation chooses what the purpose is, right? Originally, it was a one purpose corporation. And under a common law, there's something called ultra virus, where it, uh, if you decided, okay, we have a toll bridge, but now we're going to open up a pet shop and zoo. You would have to get a separate charter for that, or you'd have to amend your charter. It's like, oh, whatever. You can do whatever you want to now. Uh, and so you get enormous pools of capital uh, of this immortal entity, this for-profit corporation, which, apart from paying taxes and obeying you know, civil rights laws and environmental laws and so on, uh, it could just do whatever it wants to, right? And, and so that... Now, we take it for granted, but most people in history, including most Americans up to about a century ago, would have thought this is just really strange, right? And particularly when some of these corporations uh, are, have GDPs that are bigger than those of many countries in the world, right? And we, we've seen a tendency initially after World War II, and now we're seeing it again with the tech firms towards conglomeration. Uh, that is, so if you think about Google, they start off their search engine. They, they beat out Dogpile and Inktomi and these other search engines. Well, so, so eventually they start acquiring different things in different industries. 
And then they have so many of them, they create this holding company, Alphabet, uh, where, you know, so they'll have, they have their own Android phones, they, they have their own cars they're working on, they have the search engine, and well, why not? Uh, and this was the same logic that manifested itself, and I think it's inevitable in our system, uh, after World War II, in the 40s and the 50s, there were restraints on a vertical and uh, horizontal mergers under the US antitrust law. But you could have these conglomerates, you know, just were, were tolerated. So you got, uh, my favorite is W.R. Grace. Some of you may remember W.R. Grace. It started off as like an oil rig company, and it ended up by the 70s, it owned Little Debbie Stack Cakes. Mexican restaurants. I think they actually did own dog racing tracks in, 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 in Juarez, uh, Mexico. Uh, and it was just, uh, so the Peter Drucker, great uh, uh, immigre, uh, American uh, political analyst, he has a famous quote, he says, securities analysts don't understand companies. Companies don't make money. Companies make shoes. Right now, think about that. That's kind of the classic attitude, you know, the, the, the kind of his traditional capitalism. You make shoes. In order to make shoes, you need to make a profit. But the purpose of the profit is to make shoes. That's the public good that you're doing. You're supplying shoes through the private sector instead of having the government Soviet shoe factory. Uh, and uh, what happened with the earlier wave of conglomerates is a lot of the founders of these corporations had been engineers, uh, or, or they'd been specialists and whatever. By the 1960s, the typical route was from the CFO, the chief financial officer, to CEO. And so from the CFO's point of view, this is what Drucker was criticizing, uh, what difference does it make, right? You know, little Debbie snack cakes, dog racing track, as long as it makes money. We're just going to, going to look, at, look at that. So. So that's just, I, I just want to plant the idea into you that, that it's kind of weird, right? We take it for granted, it's kind of strange uh, that you have this government privilege, you know, for these essentially uh, protozoan, protean companies. Uh, so the foundation, the, the, the nonprofit thing is even weirder. Uh, and, and I say this as someone who founded a, what is now a $30 million nonprofit, and, and I've been in this NGO business for about, 20 years, but it's really very, very peculiar, you know, from a historical perspective. Uh, so for most of the 19th century, the nonprofits uh, were very small. Uh, I won't go into the details, but initially they were organized as trusts. And then over time, they adopt the nonprofit uh, corporate form uh, chartered by states. Uh, the states were suspicious of these. Uh, it's like, okay, well, we could have a nonprofit for uh, for, for a university or for an orphanage or something, uh, and it can have an endowment. Uh, but, you know, often uh, the endowment, the state charter stipulated that the endowment was capped at a certain amount, and there was a duration, and then the charter had to be renewed after 25 or 50 years. Uh, they, they did not want all this money being squirreled away uh, tax-free uh, from, from the state uh, revenue agencies. Uh, the, the big... <laughs> Kind of the big bang of the nonprofit world was the formation of the Rockefeller Foundation uh, in the in the early 1900s. Uh, Rockefeller was, by modern standards, just sort of picture Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett combined. I mean, that's how much money uh, he had from from Standard Oil, uh, and and he was a, a fairly pious. Baptist of a kind of northern liberal Baptist type that doesn't exist much anymore, but he, but he was, he considered himself quite Christian. He wanted to give away his money and he just couldn't deal with the thousands and thousands of grant applications, right, and, and entreaties. Uh, so he was persuaded, why don't you go from retail philanthropy to wholesale philanthropy, right? You create what is now called a non-operating foundation that gives grants to other nonprofits which makes sense if you're overwhelmed by, by entreaties from, from worthy causes. Uh, so, and he wanted to give away you know, much of this money. He didn't want it to go to his heirs. So uh, he proposed creating the Rockefeller Foundation. They drew up a contract, and he wanted the federal government to charter it. So he, uh, he requested that Congress charter it. Uh, he met a very, very hostile reaction 
on both sides of the political spectrum. Uh, uh, former President Theodore Roosevelt said basically, hell no. Uh, the current president, uh, Taft, uh, said he wants to incorporate Mr. Rockefeller. Uh, right, left, and center uh, just rejected this. This was like 1913, 1912. It's you know, a little more than 100 years ago. They say, this is crazy. This is a republic. This is a democracy. You cannot have a perpetual immortal foundation with hundreds of millions. Now it would be billions and billions of dollars. Just in perpetuity, like growing and growing and growing through interest and then doing whatever they wanted. And if you read uh, uh, the, the original prospectus for the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, I'm just quoting from memory, it goes like this. It says, you know, the purpose of the foundation shall be to promote progress and enlightenment and civilization in the United States, in its territories, and all of the countries of the world. <laughs> okay, so it's like, whatever the program officers decide, right? You know, they will have, the, and it will be tax exempt. So whereas your giant for-profit corporation has limited liability, uh, the shareholders have no recourse uh, once the assets of the corporation, you know, in, in bankruptcy have been sold off. Uh, this is a twofer, right? If you're a nonprofit foundation, you know, not only do you have limited liability, but you also, the, the taxpayers are subsidizing you through, through the uh, 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 charitable deduction and, and exemption. There, there are different versions of this. So, so this was, so Congress said, no, we refuse. The federal government is not going to charter Rockefeller Foundation. This is un-American. So they, in our federal system, whenever the federal government's standards are too stringent, you go to a state government, right? So they went to New York and New York, oh, sure, 1913. <laughs> That's the, and they get chartered. Uh, so, you know, and I've, I've, in the nonprofit world, my colleagues and I, we've benefited from uh, this system. But I'm just suggesting to you, that like the giant conglomerate corporation, which gets this, this grant of, of government privilege from a state, or sometimes from the federal government, to do whatever it wants to, as long as they make money. You don't even have to make money. A, a friend of mine one time had a scheme. Uh, he said, well, I want to create a nonprofit organization. But the problem with nonprofits is the board has all power, not the founder. So I want to be the founder. I want to keep power. So, so he was thinking about doing it as a perpetually money-losing corporation, a for-profit corporation that never made a profit. Uh, so it's kind of like the producers, right? <laughs> you know, so, uh, so these things can be gamed. Uh, so uh, uh, now, how did we get, we, nevertheless, the government did get around the purposeless foundation and the purposeless uh, corporation that it has very little control over in various ways in the 20th century and the 21st. Uh, one is there's external <clears throat> regulation. But the problem with this compared to regulation by charter is regulation by charter, it just says in the charter, you shall have a toll bridge, it shall be this wide, you know. And if, you, if you try to regulate businesses in general, everything from Boeing to, you know, uh, uh, you know like the, the dog kennel, has to be kind of general, so, so that's a problem. Uh, uh, in addition to external regulation, there are other forms that you can use, and, and we have used, uh, for, the, for enterprises that promote the public good. There are cooperatives. Uh, uh, near where I live in Austin, Texas, the Texas Hill Country was developed in the New Deal period by the Lower Colorado River Authority, which is organized as cooperatives owned by local farmers and ranchers with their own government. And, and it was deliberately done to prevent uh, capitalists like uh, Samuel Insull who controlled the whole Midwestern electrical grid uh, from you know, get, making money every time you turn on a light. So, so you have consumer cooperatives, uh, you have uh, publicly regulated utilities, so-called price and entry utilities. Uh, you have uh, government contractors, like defense contractors. So a private corporation that's in manufacturing can say, okay, we're gonna shut down all manufacturing in Steubenville and move it to China. Uh, if it's a defense contractor, you know, we, you've got to get permission from the Pentagon to do that. So, so there's a difference. And finally, there's state socialism. Uh, not in the Marxist revolutionary sense, but in what was called sewer socialism. Uh, it's municipal socialism, you know, uh, uh, a century ago. There's some things where why don't, why don't you just do it at cost out of taxes instead of 
trying to come up with rigging the market so that people make a great amount of money doing it. Uh, uh, Austin, Texas, where I live, uh, I pay my bills to the city of Austin, the electrical bills. It's a municipal corporate socialist electrical company. And I've had very good dealings with them. Uh, George Washington was a municipal socialist. Uh, few people realize that uh, up until after World War II, we had a socialist military industry in the United States, the arsenal system. Uh, one of the first acts of the Washington administration, of which Alexander Hamilton was sometimes called the prime minister, was to create a system of government arsenals. Uh, the Army and the Navy made their own weapons, and they made their own material from uh, 1790 or so all the way up until the 1950s. Uh, and they still exist. Uh, and in wartime, the federal arsenals in, in Lexington and, and in uh, Springfield and elsewhere uh, would ramp up production, surge production, by uh, making contracts with private producers. And then they would dial it down, but that way you always kept a minimum of manufacturing capability, which was the goal of Washington uh, and Hamilton. So you didn't lose it between wars. Uh, by, by the way, this, uh, this arsenal system uh, jump-started uh, American industrialization in some ways because it pioneered uh, the interchangeable parts system uh, where you have absolutely standard parts and then you slap them together for rifles. Uh, and this spreads to the private sector initially with, with gunsmiths and then bicycles and then automobiles and so on. And that's called the American system, uh, distinct from the American system that uh, Johnny uh, will talk about. So, so that's the end of my provocations. Uh, I just want to, to sort of shake things up. I have no particular great proposals, but if we're talking about the public purpose, uh, I just think maybe we should reconsider just giving a blank check compared with essentially vast powers and enormous tax subsidies in the case of the nonprofit sector to immortal self-perpetuating groups, right? Which are engrossing more and more uh, uh, of, of the economy in some cases over time. Uh, so. So that's my story, and I'm sticking with it, officer. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Michael and Saurabh. It's an honor to be here. Um, my response uh, to Michael will be by way of uh, dispelling illusions, but I'm going to be going back to the 18th and 19th century, and then we'll connect the dots together. Uh, in particular, one of the, the biggest charges against common good capitalism is the accusation that, is, that it comes from the old world. I think Jonah Goldberg had a piece about this a week ago, saying slouching towards the old world, the ideas being put forward in the vision of political economy that someone like Michael Lind would have are really nothing more than foreign imports. They're un-American. And actually, if you scratch the surface, they have fascist roots. And uh, I'm here today to, to say that that is uh, unequivocally false. Uh, and I hope to prove to you how the American tradition uh, specifically the tradition of political economy espoused by two very influential but forgotten Catholics, Matthew Carey and Henry Charles Carey, played a pivotal role in shaping the architecture of 18th and 19th century American political economy towards both the common good and the national interest. Uh, interestingly enough, it's actually the free trade maximalism that many of the critics of common good capitalism have uh, that has its origins in the Confederate South and in the British Empire. Uh, the Confederate South depended on this system for their uh, system of slavery and cotton exporting, and the British imperialists uh, wanted to keep America a backwards uh, agricultural uh, nation. They did not want us to industrialize and usurp uh, their global hegemony. So that's actually the origins of the free trade maximalist ideology. Uh, but thanks to Matthew and Henry Carey, who were really the brains behind the Hamiltonian vision of economics, um, that system was ultimately defeated. Uh, so I'll begin with Matthew Carey and talk a little bit about his, uh, his biography. So Matthew Carey was born in uh, 1760 in Dublin, Ireland. He was the son of a middle-class family, and he was a very fiery pamphleteer at a young age. So at 17, he wrote his first article. Uh, it was a tract against dueling. Uh, remember that, because that'll come back later in his life. It was a tract against dueling because one of his best friends died in a duel. The second thing he ever wrote was the most provocative thing, and this changed the entire course of his life. Uh, he wrote a pseudonymous uh, pamphlet arguing for a repeal of the penal code against Roman Catholics in Ireland. 
Now, he wrote it uh, in, in the fiery language, and on the very first page of the pamphlet, there was a poem, and the poem basically threatened rebellion. He said, repeal the penal code now, or else there are Catholics waiting in the wings, and they are going to rebel everywhere throughout the empire. Well, the British didn't like this at all, uh, but interesting, interestingly enough for the friends uh, here at the post-liberal order, uh, it was actually the establishment Catholics in Ireland that hated this the most. There was something called the Catholic Committee, and this was an elite group of Catholic gentry, and they thought that this young 21-year-old was being way too provocative. They cared very much about what their respectable, uh, elite uh, British Anglicans thought of them, and so they were very gentle and pushing for uh, the uh, liberties for Catholics at the time. So actually, this group called the Catholic Committee decided to dox the anonymous author of this pamphlet. They said, this, whoever wrote this is guilty of sedition and treason against the crown, and we will find and expose this young boy. So they sought to uh, expose him, and Matthew Carey had to flee and go into exile. He went into exile in Paris at the age of 21 and winded up working in Benjamin Franklin's printing shop. So here he's working in Franklin's printing shop. He meets the Marquis de Lafayette, and they become fast friends. And then after a year, they say, you got to get back to Ireland, start a newspaper, and you know, advocate for Irish independence. So it's here that Kerry realizes that, that Irish manufacturing is key for Irish independence, because he doesn't want to be part of the British economic system. If they can establish and protect and promote Irish manufacturing, then they can finally break away from the British Empire. Well, England doesn't like this, so they throw him in jail. Uh, he's in jail, but he's released on bail, and so he hatches this plot to escape to America, uh, but he does it uh, with the Marquis de Lafayette and by cross-dressing. He dresses up as a woman, <laughs> and he meets the Marquis de Lafayette on a ship called America, and he sails for Philadelphia. So he lands in Philadelphia, he's connected to all the early founders, friends with Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Adams, all those guys. And uh, Lafayette gives him $400 to start a paper called the Pennsylvania Republican. Uh, he's, again, a very feisty uh, guy. And so as soon as he gets to Philadelphia, he, there's a rival newspaper in town. The editor of the rival newspaper insults him. And so he challenges him to a duel. Okay, <laughs> And uh, he almost dies in the duel. He's shot. He's gravely wounded. But he survives, and he learns his lesson. And from that point on, he takes his Catholic faith very seriously. Uh, he was well respected by a lot of the Protestants in Philadelphia, but he noticed that their approach to, um, to charity was deficient. It didn't have sufficient Catholic social teaching. They didn't really understand the salvific nature of charity. So he worked very hard to incorporate principles of Catholic social teaching into philanthropy in Philadelphia at the time. He published the first Catholic Bible in America uh, when he started his uh, publishing company that would become one of the most successful publishing companies in the country. He then advised Alexander Hamilton at the Treasury Department. And then fast forward a little bit, after the War of 1812, uh, he begins to notice the devastation uh, of the British. And after, after the War of 1812, the British decided to destroy American manufacturing that had sprung up during the war. So the British are dumping at a loss all sorts of excess goods into the American market. John Adams writes in 1816 with the express purpose of annihilating American manufacturing. So it's here that Carey forms a society called the Philadelphia Society to promote industry. Uh, he begins forming this protectionist group to promote the American school and American system of economics. And he actually writes a treatise called The Olive Branch, which was a refutation of Adam Smith's uh, The Wealth of Nations. So here in Philadelphia is really the seat of both uh, an economic nationalism, but also an economic localism, because everything is also benefiting Philadelphia, including the construction of a canal uh, between the Chesapeake Bay and the Delaware River that uh, Cary uh, helped to fund and develop so that Philadelphia could beat Baltimore uh, in terms of local economic production. Now, <clears throat> Cary ends up passing away, and his son, Henry Charles Cary, uh, takes over the family publishing business. He's immensely successful. He retires early in 1835. Now, the son did not follow in his father's footsteps, at least at first. 
His son was a devotee of Adam Smith. He was a diehard free trader. Uh, his, his work was actually admired greatly by Friedrich Bastiad. And it wasn't until 1842 that the sons started to realize that after the compromise uh, tariff of 1833, that a lot of the uh, manufacturing in, in Pennsylvania started to tank once the tariffs were reduced. So at this point in time, the son becomes uh, an economic patriot in the mold of his father and begins to really expand and take his ideas to the next level. By 1860, um, the Sun had written the protection of home industry plank into the GOP platform in Chicago at the convention. Now, this was absolutely essential for Abraham Lincoln winning the primary, because without Pennsylvania, Lincoln would not have won the primary. Uh, Kerry would go on to be the chief economic advisor to Lincoln at the Treasury Department, and really the architect of, of the American system, which believed in promoting uh, uh, tariffs and subsidies to protect and promote domestic manufacturing, a national bank, and internal improvement system. It was really a, uh, a, a Marshall Plan, but in reverse. It wasn't trying to control the economy from the top down, but per putting certain structures in place so that there could be growth, national development, and innovation. Uh, I will close with two things. First, I want to uh, give you a little bit of a taste for some of the ideas uh, that the Carries promoted. And I think it's best actually to hear it from them. So I've included a pamphlet in the spirit of uh, uh, pamphleteering uh, on your, on your um, chairs. And I'm gonna read a few points. This is from the father, Matthew Carey, 1819, addressed to the Philadelphia Society for Promoting Industry. He says, this is a statement of those maxims of political economy, the soundness of which is established by the experience of the wisest as well as the most fatuous nations on earth. So here are his key points. Number one, industry is the only sure foundation for national virtue, happiness, and greatness. Number two, no nation has ever prospered to the extent of which it was susceptible without due protection of domestic industry. Number eight, free government is not happiness. It is only the means but wisely employed of ensuring happiness. Number nine, the interests of agricultural manufacturing and commerce are inseparably connected. Number 10, the home market for the production of the earth and manufacturers is of more importance than all of the foreign ones, even in countries with an immense foreign commerce. And last, and I think this is really important in light of uh, Patrick's uh, slideshow yesterday, he says, it is impossible for a nation possessed of immense natural advantages in endless diversity in soil and climate to suffer any great or general distress in its agriculture, commerce, and manufacturing unless there be vital and radical errors in its system of political economy. So if you look at the United States, I think you can say it's a nation possessed of immense natural advantages. And so if you see something like the blight that Patrick pointed out in Steubenville or Detroit or South Bend, uh, Matthew Carey would respond to that by concluding that that only came about not by accident, but by design as a result of vital and radical errors in the system of political economy. And so I would encourage you all to rediscover the great writing and tradition of Matthew and Henry Carey, because I think it can help us to turn around that blight today. And one final word, uh, I think it is encouraging both to the, the Catholics in the room that even from the start of our nation's founding, that there were Catholics who had a vision of Catholic social teaching, a vision of the common good, and they were able to effectively incorporate it, maybe not perfectly, but at least substantially into our nation's political economy. Uh, and I will close on that note. Thank you.